I literally got like two of these in the same box. They are a while. Hey guys, it's Mono Making Time and today we're looking at the Avia B35 by KP Models, obviously in the one scale. One seventy second scale, obviously. Okay, jokes aside, just like with people, everything is welcome here. <laughs> so yeah, we are looking at the B35. This is a Czech aircraft or Czechoslovakian aircraft as it would have been at the time. And as usual, we're gonna go through the history of the aircraft in real life. We'll go through the history of the kit. Normally, I also do a little segment about the aircraft in gaming. However, this aircraft does not feature pretty much in gaming at all. Um, we'll go into that in a little bit of detail, but yeah. So pretty much just the two sections today. And then obviously we'll build the model and show it off. <laughs> just so you know, I bought this kit at Boscom Down Model Show. If you haven't seen the video, check the link up there. Now, I don't know if you can see on the box from where I am, but I bought this for four pounds. This is the old boxing of the KP kit, and it literally had two B35s in there, which is wild. I don't think it was meant to have that in there, but it does. Um, I have lost one of the canopies now, though, so I, d I do have one left, but I, I really like the box art on this. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I got the kit. Let's have a look at the history of the aircraft then. So first of all, I guess we should probably understand the Avia company a little bit. The company was founded by four people. I'm just gonna try and say the names, but I'll probably say them wrong. Pavel Benez, Miroslav Hein, Yaroslav Frantisek, and Václav Malay. I am so sorry if I said any of those names wrong. They founded it in 1919 and it eventually became part of the Skoda Works in 1928. During the 1930s, Avia would become the largest aviation manufacturer in Czechoslovakia. Now, today, Avia is pretty much known for building lorries, but, you know, back then, they were a massive complex in the aviation industry. Perhaps not very well known today because it didn't really see service outside of, you know, Central Europe and was you know, limited in conflicts due to how the war progressed in the early stages, but Avia produced the B534, which was a biplane fighter which reminds me of sort of, you know, the Gloucester Gladiator CR42, that last generation of biplanes that really upped the NT and showed that biplanes did have a final little bit of bite left in them. Now, the B534 would be like many of its contemporaries and lead to the production of a monoplane version. If you aren't really sure what I mean, have a look at the Hawker Hind or the Fiat CR42 and you can really see the direct lineage from you know, biplane to modify fighter, and this is another example where you can see the similarities in the fuselage, for example, quite strongly. The B-35 was a Czechoslovakian fighter designed to replace the B-534 we previously mentioned. The aircraft has a really short and sad history, however, due to it being developed in the late 1930s and well, German occupation would come not very long after. We've already mentioned the biplanes the Spyder reminds me of, but it also draws comparisons with the similar Fokker D21, not in the least because it is a fixed undercarriage aircraft. Now in the Dutch variant, as we mentioned in the video here, it was the Dutch government who said the undercarriage was too complex and too costly, and so decided to go for fixed undercarriage and well, in this version it was quite similar. It was the Czechoslovakian Air Force, Czechoslovakian Levetsko. I have probably absolutely butchered that, but hey, at least I'm trying, right? <laughs> it was the Czechoslovakian Air Force who actually put the restrictions in place. They said that the undercarriage or the mechanisms to develop the undercarriage weren't yet available. Whether this was being developed internally or whether it was for import, I couldn't quite see but it does draw sort of comparisons with what other manufacturers are doing, like Fokker in the Netherlands. The aircraft is perhaps most well known for having a really unique shape, in that it has the elliptical wings that we are familiar with on the Spitfire. Now, it's not as successful as the Spitfire, and it would never reach its heights, however, it does have that reminiscent shape, sort of in that family with the HE-112 Spitfire, you know? The engine itself was a Hispano Suez Y-12 DRS, which was later replaced with a CRS variant to allow an autocannon to be mounted in the center of the propeller. The variant of the engine that the Avia B-35 used produced 880 horsepower, when you compare it to perhaps the most well-known user of the engine, the D520, 
that produced 910 horsepower. So it's perhaps fair to say that maybe the performance wasn't too far off, but given that this is a fixed undercarriage design, it was obviously never going to quite reach the heights of, you know, its contemporaries which had retractable undercarriage at that time. The first flight of the aircraft was the 28th of September 1938 and testing would continue for almost two months up until the 22nd of November 1938. At this time, the aircraft unfortunately crashed, killing its test pilot. Testing would continue and resume with developments made to the aircraft, however, Germany's occupation was not very far behind it. Under German occupation, the aircraft also sought development, becoming the, the third sort of type of the aircraft. The aircraft performed at Salon de l'Aeronautique Brussels and did secure some interest in the aircraft, leading to the development of the later version of the aircraft, the B135. However, that is a story for another day. So that is the short and sad tale of the Ava B35. Let's go and have a look at the history of the kit. Looking at the history of this kit is quite interesting because obviously last week we produced one of the newest KP model kits that's available and I was amazed by its quality. And this is an older KP kit dating back to 1974 and it's night and day the comparison, it's quite astounding really. It sort of reminds me of like really old airfix kits against the new airfix kits, it's, it's that sort of level of difference, it's amazing. But yes, as we said, 1974 was when this kit was originally released and it looks like it's had at least four boxings. Now, two of the boxings are nearly the same, that's the 1974 and a early 2000s boxing, but then in the middle of that, in the 1990s, there was a box art which took the original image of the aircraft, slightly rotated it and made it flying and it looks a bit weird. <laughs> I think because I'm so used to the original B35 boxing and I really love the box art, it just, it looks off to me because I know that that's not the original picture. Now that image would also be used for the newest boxing of the kit that I can see which was when KP was going for sort of this harsh industrial-esque look on their boxings. I don't think I've ever bought a kit whilst it was in that boxing but it looks better than I guess the older ones did. Other than that, I don't think there really are really any releases of the B-35. It's a relatively unknown aircraft and most people who've heard of any of the Czech aircraft of this era probably think of the Avia B-534, the biplane, or they think of the B-135 because that saw significant service compared to the B-35. So it's not really a surprise that there's not really a lot to it. <laughs> then I guess it's time we have a look inside the box. <laughs> Right then, let's have a look inside the box. Unfortunately, I had some technical issues, so I haven't got footage of everything, unfortunately, but I've taken some close-ups. You don't see the canopy, but it's sort of meh. And uh, yeah, it's not too bad, but it's not great either, but it's definitely a good kit considering its age. And as you can see, I definitely got two kits parts and I don't know why that I got that in my kit, but I did. So we're just gonna ignore that and we'll focus on the fact that it's one kit. But I mean, I think you can see from the parts already, they're not bad considering their age but it is a really really simple kit don't expect anything complex don't expect any super high detail it's a basic kit but you know what for what it is it's absolutely superb especially considering its age <laughs> Okay, that was a very short look inside the box, as you probably expected when I said this reminds me of old frog kits, there wasn't a lot inside of the box. Literally a couple of sprues and the clear canopy part, so yeah, not a lot to it, and this model I did on um, a stream on the Mars Models stream that uh, happens on Monday, so go check them out if you haven't seen them, but I literally pretty much did it in one stream. I think I did it at like, the very end of one stream and then painted it on another. It's a really you know, quick kit to do. So let's go have a look at me doing that construction and painting. <laughs> Straight into the construction then, we're gluing the wings together and like the unboxing, unfortunately I had some technical issues. I've, as you can see, I've changed my layout and I've got a pink background, but um, I, I had a lot of technical issues during the course of this recording. Uh, my camera just did not agree with my PC. It turned out it was the USB hub, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> We're just gonna go on and talk about the assembly. So this kit went together really easily, but there were some challenges. Now you can build this to have a stand as well. Uh, it does come with one in the box as you will have seen. You do just put a little hole in basically um, to put it onto the stand. And it's quite common for KB kits. And I suppose FX and frog kits of this era as well. Now, 
once I've stuck the wings together, I was sitting king at the cockpit, and when I cockpit, I mean the seat, and for whatever reason, I could not do it with my fingers, probably to use my nails, so I had to resort to the old tweezers, the most important thing in my arsenal. I didn't put the prop together fully on a camera by accident, but it's pretty much, you know, a really simple uh, design. It's got a stopper, you know, the propeller shaft itself, um, and the actual prop spinner. But for whatever reason, I found it was really gappy. It didn't really fit very well. So I ended up gluing my prop in place. There is a little part that goes over the top of the front of the fuselage. Um, and you will see that bit in place. Because again, unfortunately, I didn't quite capture it on camera. But I found that even with that in place, it wasn't holding the propeller in place properly. I think I just left too much of a gap between the front of the prop spinner um, and sort of the end of the shaft, unfortunately. But, you know, it's not the end of the world. It is what it is. Now, the wings I did find didn't fit, <laughs> like just flat out didn't fit, and it wasn't the sideways where I would be the wings, it was sort of the actual depth of the wings themselves, they just wouldn't fit, and I ended up sort of just like gradually working on it and, you know, using a lot of glue to soften the plastic at the back and the front, and it did eventually fit, I did eventually get it on, but I did have to use putty afterwards to just sort of fill in the gaps, because it just, it wasn't a good fit but I mean I'm not really that surprised again given the age of the kit. Now once I'd done that it was a case of putting the wheel assembly on afterwards and that was pretty much it for the kit. The kit was pretty much done and uh, ready for painting. Now you can see here I'm going on with a dark earth shade and that's the base colour that I'm going with and I'll go over then with sort of a, I think I use Ravel's ochre colour and then I go with a really dark green, almost sort of a blackish olive green colour as well and that's to get sort of the full three colour scheme that um, I think the Czechoslovakian Air Force used on most of their paintings at the time. Now at the moment it does look really blocky, it doesn't look very detailed, it looks really unfinished, but don't worry, that's just the initial coats and it's really common when you're using acrylic paints and brush painting them. You won't get it like with an airbrush where it's like a really consistent, lovely colour. You might have to go over it a couple of times just to make sure you're doing thin enough layers that you're not going to clog up any of the detail. I think you can see that it has really built up in colour, it looks really actually quite nice and once we get the undercoat, uh, not the undercoat sorry, the underside done as well, we're really going to have a really complete looking model. The underside is just sort of a light grey colour, I think it's literally Ravel's, uh, Ravel Aqua Colours light grey. Um, I had to do quite a lot of coats of this, it just doesn't go on very thickly but you know better to be safe than sorry. Now the light grey colour does go up onto the sort of the side of the aircraft at the back, which again, quite common in World War II aircraft, but it did mean whilst I was handling it, I somehow managed to get it on top and had to recover it, and this actually happened a couple of times. I was just a bit clumsy, I think I was a bit stressed because of the camera constantly disconnecting whilst I was on stream, and it was very unfortunate, but hey-ho, we resolved it in the end. <laughs> It's really a case then of just adding the finishing touches, going over, making sure you're happy with all the paint. I basically just tried to follow the box and get a camouflage scheme that I was happy with. And looking at the end result now, I am actually really happy with how it looks. It seems like a really basic design and for whatever reason, it looks really weird. But once you have the canopy on, it really brings everything together. And the canopy just has sort of the basic ochre colour over it. So, um, you don't have to mess around with, you know, masking if you don't really want to. Now the decals themselves are again are really simple. There's a 3 and an S, so the aircraft designation. And then there's also the Czechoslovakian Air Force symbols and the Avia aircraft symbol as well. And that's really all you have to put on. I think I have got my round all the wrong way round, sadly. Um, the black and white instructions. I don't know why, I just couldn't understand them and then I think I did one sort of almost right and then one not right and then I changed it around and yeah, I just kept befuddling myself. <laughs> okay, so that was it. A really, really quick and easy kit. Really lovely and easy to do. Um, but I'm excited for you to see how it looks. Now I'm just going to say that the instructions, because they were in black and white, for some reason my head, I really struggled to understand which colour goes where in terms of the check round all. And then I think I check something for one and then check something for another and however I did it, I just got it wrong. So I know on the tail at least one bit of it's wrong, maybe all of it's wrong. So I really apologise that I've got the roundels 99% wrong. However, 
I still think it looks okay. Let's go and have a look at the shots of it popping off. <laughs> Well, what do you think? Not too bad, right? It is a simple kit and I painted it with just whatever I had lying around. I think I ended up using two extra acrylic colours and a Ravel colour, along with some extra Ravel colours for the propeller parts, so it was just a mixture of what I had. In terms of weathering, I did try to use a little bit of heavy weathering. I did some like heavy mud texture on the front of the uh, landing I was going to say landing gear, but landing assembly because it's fixed. And I tried to do it on the bottom of the air intake as well. Um, and I, because in my head it was like, it was getting really muddy because it was just like a really gross, muddy environment that's in the winter. It's just trying to test. So that's that's what I was going for. Um, otherwise, I just used some black weathering powder on it as well, just to give it a little bit of an edge. But I didn't really do too much to it. Um, the aircraft itself I feel looks really nice, it's a really simple kit, really easy kit and I mean I got this for £4 and it was one you could just turn your brain off and just do. So I guess that takes me to buy or fly. Now I think this is quite an easy one because it's an old kit that you're not going to see anywhere else so it's not like you can compare this and be like oh well this one isn't quite as good as the Italeri or Vesta kit. It's literally a case of, do you want to build a B35 or not? Because if you don't have them, then why are you even looking? But also, I guess the other factor is its price. I don't think I've ever seen these kits go for more than like £8 at like model shows. If you buy them online, they probably do cost more. And I wouldn't bother to be heard, but to play honest with you, unless you're really super into building check aircraft, in which case, like, queen and just do it. I mean, as I say, I got it for like £4 and I also got like the B534 and its predecessor for £5 at the St. Ives model show. So you can really get some bargains on these old KP cuts. And they're also just like super easy, you know, they take no time at all. You can just throw them together and they look nice. Like I said during the course of the video as well, these are very much like really old school kits where it's super simple, like old frog kits. Some people absolutely love that design, some people hate it. But I don't think we're ever going to see a reissue of this kit. It, there's just not going to be enough interest. Maybe the B135, but not the B35. So I personally would say buy this kit. It's super cheap, super affordable. If you are new to the hobby, it's a fantastic introduction. You don't have to worry if you screw up. Like, it's a full good kit. Honey, even in this recession, you can afford that. And like, it's an unusual subject. It's something a bit fun, a bit quirky, a bit different. So breaking up the monotony of buildings, spitfires, hurricanes, they have water lines and all that jazz, because as much as I love building them, sometimes you just want to build something that's just a bit different. <laughs> well guys, that's gonna do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me on this building of the B35. If you like what you've seen in this video, make sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel to see new videos every Monday. Also, let me know in the comments what display team do you want to see me build because I'm going through trying to work out what I'm building for 2023 and that's one of the things I'm trying to work out right now. Be ready first. <laughs> If you do feel inclined to help out the channel, you can support me over on Ko-fi. It's sort of like Patreon, but you can do one-off donations or you can do monthly donations. Obviously, please only do this if it's financially sound for you to do so, but the link is in the description and you can see it on the screen here. It does help me out to buy supplies, model kits and all that jazz, so I really appreciate it. And if you can't, hey, just being here is enough. You guys are absolutely amazing and thank you, yes, you in particular for being here and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!
thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button and notification bell to be notified of every new video on Mondays. You'll also be able to see me stream live on YouTube. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Have fun modelling!